Josh, thank you very much for joining us. I'm sure you've lost count of the number of interviews you've been on the end of in recent months. Um, we really appreciate you being here. Before we get into some of the momentous achievements of Good Meat this past 12 months, let's find out a bit about you, your background. So what drives you to walk towards a more sustainable food system? Was there any specific moment or experience that reaffirmed your commitment to this mission? Mm, I think there, there are a handful of things that are driving me, but probably the, the thing that drives me most is a want not to cause so much harm to animals. Um, I think we can all figure out a way to enjoy chicken and hamburgers and all the food that we want without causing all this suffering. Um, and uh, my best friend and co-founder of the company uh, years ago, uh, more than 25 years ago, really opened up my eyes to what we were doing. And um, our work is uh, along the lines of, of wanting a better way to do it. So it was really his influence and a connection I have with animals that more than anything are the, the driving forces behind the work I do. Mm -hmm. So Eat Just, I believe, is the parent company. How and why did Good Meat sprout from that? Well, it, it, it all comes down to this question of how do we solve the meat problem? And we have tens of billions of animals that are slaughtered every single year. We have billions of people who enjoy eating chicken, beef, pork, and lamb, the four most commonly consumed animal proteins and all the fish. Uh, do we ask them to eat beans instead, which is a really good option? Uh, do we ask them to eat uh, plant-based foods instead, which is a really good option? Or would it be more effective to ask them to eat meat, real meat, but just made in a better way? Mm -hmm. um, and of those three options, we think the most effective is the latter. And to do that, you need to figure out a way to cultivate it or culture it uh, instead of slaughtering it. Uh, so we decided that we should start a cultivated meat division in the company more than seven years ago now. Um, we uh, talked with leading scientists uh, around North America and the world about how to do that. How do you get the cell? How do you develop the cell line? How do you scale it up? And then with a little bit of knowledge, we decided to start hiring people and actually build a program that, uh, that we could be really proud of. Mm. Now, you could no doubt cite many milestones, but which one would you pick as the biggest? I'm guessing the green light from USDA, um, FDA, would, but I could be wrong. <laughs> Yeah, far and away the biggest is when we became the first company in the world to sell cultivated meat in December 2020 in Singapore. Mm -hmm. That was I think, the most significant milestone for the industry, uh, the most significant professional accomplishment that I've ever had. Uh, for 50 plus years, we've been talking about uh, what it could look like to eat cultivated meat. And then we did it. And uh, a group of kids sat around a table at a restaurant called 1880 in Singapore. And um, we launched Cultivated Meat globally for the first time. That was that was the most significant. Mm -hmm. And this is probably a stupid question, but why chicken first as opposed to any other meat? It was a bit, uh, a bit of um, just serendipity that the chicken cell line happened to work the best in the early days of the company. And it turns out to be the most consumed animal protein in the world. But mm -hmm. we'll, we'll, we'll work it on beef planning to submit that before the end of the year and pork and lamb. And uh, we want to build an infrastructure that allows us to do all these kinds of animal proteins. Now, our magazine is all about the technology, so we're going to move on to that now. Could you explain the process of creating cultivated meat or good meat and, and how your process differs from other players, perhaps, in the sector? Um, well, so the, the process of cultivating meat is pretty similar uh, regardless of... Uh, of the companies out there, it all starts with a cell. And you get that cell from a cell bank, um, a biopsy of an animal, a fresh piece of meat. Then you identify nutrients to feed the cell. So think amino acids, sugar, salts. Um, and then you scale it up. And we scale it up in a stainless steel vessel called a bioreactor, where it's doubling over the course of about three weeks. Mm -hmm. um, then we remove it from the bioreactor and then we convert it into a finished product, which then makes it look like a chicken nugget or a chicken strip or a hamburger. Uh, that process is pretty similar. Uh, there are some nuance um, amongst all the companies. There's some nuances in the kinds of bioreactors that people uh, use. Uh, some companies also integrate 3D printing uh, into it, which we think is a, a really compelling technology. Mm -hmm. um, but we're able to do it now at very small volumes. So only a single butcher shop in Singapore and a single restaurant run by Jose Andres in Washington, D.C. Um, and we're um, moving to a process where we can make tens of millions of pounds of this. And that's a 
very challenging technical, financial, um, emotional path, mm -hmm. uh, but we're giving them to go. Yeah, I bet it is. And how has the technology behind um, the product evolved um, since you first started looking into this? Um, so we've we've had some significant uh, breakthroughs on cell densities. So cell density is a measure of how efficiently uh, the uh, the meat will grow, or more specifically, how quickly the cell is doubling. Um, so we've increased our cell density pretty significantly since the early days. We've been successful in reducing our media costs, um, and we've learned a lot about uh, the design and engineering of bioreactors and how to optimize that for the purpose of making meat uh, more cost effectively. Mm -hmm. And does the process change a great deal when moving from chicken to beef, pork, lamb, or anything else, for instance? The the fundamentals are pretty simple. Get the cell, the cell, grow the cell, convert it to a finished product. Um, some some small differences, but the, the big principles are the same. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the, the main cost drivers in cultivating meat, I mean, you mentioned the cell lines and those growth factors. How will or can these costs um, reduce to make the product more competitive with conventional um, proteins? Yeah, so the big drivers of costs are cell density, so how quickly the cells are doubling or how quickly you can make the meat in a given period of time. The cost of the feed, which we call media, uh, and the this infrastructure. So the larger the vessel, the more you can make in a given period of time. So we're working on all three. How do we increase our cell densities um, north of 50? How do we reduce our media cost to, ten, to the tens of cents per liter? How do we get into big vessels? And only when we or other companies are able to get past those three very significant hurdles will we find a path to be below the cost or at the cost chicken, beef, pork, uh, or, or lamb. Mm -hmm. I mean, of all the innovations or technologies to have improved the efficiency of your process <clears throat> over the years, which one would you pick out as key? Um, there's really no, not a single, it's really those three. You have to nail those three. You've got to nail the, the scale up in the vessel. You've got to nail cell density and you've got to nail media cost. If you have one and not the other, you're not, you're not going to win. It's, um, it's like, uh, if you want to have an electric car that is working properly the brakes need to work the battery needs to work the acceleration needs to work uh the safety overall needs to work um so all, all three are really vital mm -hmm. now scaling you mentioned it before remains a significant challenge especially given the supposed uh, bioreactor bottleneck um how much are you currently able to produce a year and, and what are the timelines for increasing that capacity maxed out we can do in the tens of thousands of pounds a year which is not very much at all mm -hmm. um and in order to to make tens of millions we'll need to move from the scale that we're at today which is about 3500 liters to a hundred thousand plus liters two hundred thousand mm -hmm. plus liters um and that's that'll require more significant investments to require um getting over some technical challenges so we're talking years not not months to be able to do that mm-hmm um, could you share some insights into the environmental impact of cultivated meat production, particularly in terms of reducing GHGs and land use, water, for instance? Yeah. Well, I think it starts with really understanding what conventional meat is doing on our planet today. So about a third of the planet is dedicated just to planting soy and corn to feed the animals we eat. Conventional meat is responsible for more GHGs than all the animal, all the transportation sources combined. Um, so we want to cultivate meat to create a meat product that is less intensive in, term, in terms of its carbon output. Um, early studies show that 70, 80% less carbon intensive, less water, less land intensive. But ultimately we have to measure this at scale, not measure it in a model. Because right, mm -hmm. right now everything is measured. People put assumptions in the spreadsheet and then those assumptions are calculated and then a number is spit out. And then someone like me gives an answer based on that, right? Mm -hmm. Ultim ultimately this has to be scaled up. We have to look at the real data from the scale up and then and then ultimately we'll see but uh, all things point to this being a lot more efficient than the current way we do it mm -hmm. now how important is renewable energy in your production process now, i know there was a piece of widely distributed mm -hmm. research from uc davis recently that made many assumptions that didn't actually reflect what was happening in the industry today and unfortunately it spread a lot faster and wider than the industry response after 
Yeah, renewable energy is really, really vital. So we'll want any facility that we build, any large-scale facility, to be powered by some renewable source, whether that's wind or solar or um, uh, or uh, even nuclear. Um, uh, using fossil fuels is not not the way to power the facility, either from a cost or a or a, um, a carbon point of view. Mm-hmm. We're going to move on to sort of market growth and consumer acceptance now, Josh. Now, your products are already available uh, in China, um, Chilcano by Andre, uh, Jose Andres in Washington. Um, is this the business model for the immediate future, supplying the food sector at the high end? I mean, what is your roadmap for you to, for instance, mm. get your products onto supermarket shelves, if indeed that is an ambition? Well, anything that we do today before large scale is going to be determined, constrained by the ability for us to produce. <clears throat> so... Um, we're not in retail right now because we can't produce enough for it to make sense to be in retail. This sort of necessitates a restaurant approach. So it's not until we can make tens of millions of pounds or even a million pounds that retail really ends up making much sense. So today it's focused on working with chefs who have an enormous amount of credibility like Jose Andres, getting on their menu, uh, getting them to uh, taste it to share their experience uh, with it, um, and then with that, it builds up the credibility of cultivated meat, mm-hmm. and that helps consumer acceptance as well. Um, as far as penetration goes, I mean, do you, do you foresee a largely localized industry in the future with companies providing pockets of regions um, with a localized product on a smaller scale, or do you think we need a sort of KFC or company of that ilk to really turbocharge the sector, similar to what McDonald's has done for Beyond or Burger King for Impossible, for instance? Um, I think it'll be both. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it'll be too different to the way any food product ends up scaling, whether that's in the plant-based world or or otherwise. You'll have folks focusing locally. You'll probably have a few big players like uh, like a McDonald's who decide to get behind this. Uh, mm-hmm. I think all are necessary, and I think you need a lot of companies going after this too. Um, I think mm-hmm. there are a number of different approaches. Um, all of this is hard and you need lots of smart people experimenting with different different ways of getting at it. Yeah. Um, in terms of the consumer, what are their main concerns that you've heard? And what do you say to alleviate those concerns? I'm thinking, you know, the, the, the phrase Franken foods, et cetera. Well, most consumers who have, um, who have tried it have just said, wow, this is really good. It tastes like chicken. I'll have some more. Um, <laughs> when, when we get into why consumers would be hesitant about this, often what you hear is some combination of like, this just sounds weird, right? What do you mean a stainless steel vessel? What do you mean a cell line, right? These aren't terms that people are used to hearing associated with their hamburger. Mm -hmm. Um, So our approach to that is just to very clearly, openly talk about the process, get a cell, feed the cell, scale it up. This is what the bioreactor looks like. This is what it looks like when it comes out of the bioreactor. This is the process for converting it into the finished product. Um, and we found when people understand it a bit more, so it wrote, it it moves from sort of this lab-grown label to, okay, wait a second, this is the process. I can see it. There's some comfort there. And then we, we find when we also compare it to conventional meat, uh, that gives some comfort to um, conventional chicken today as an example is one of the most lab grown food products on the planet the chicken is literally lab grown lab engineered to produce as much meat as it possibly can as she possibly can over the course of 45 days and then is 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 slaughtered um the the chicken is so heavy uh she can barely walk around um it's the most unnatural food product one of the most unnatural food products there is. So mm-hmm. when we also explain that to people, the stainless steel vessel doesn't sound quite as bad. Yeah, yeah. some of those practices are abhorrent. Um, now, I'm sure you don't spend uh, any time observing what is written about this sector in some quarters of the mainstream press, um, but I'm personally seeing a, a bit of a campaign waged against the cell cultivated industry, similar to what we've seen in the plant-based sector. I even mm. saw a report the other day that uh, one customer accused McDonald's of already serving him lab grown chicken, as he called, which is uh, laughable. How can the industry compete with these seemingly louder voices? Um, well, there's no avoiding. I think first is you just got to accept that there's 
going to be a lot of pushback. That's just mm-hmm. the way it is. there's no there's no amount of um, progress that we can make that's going to eliminate pushback that you find from the industry or um, some consumers like the one that you mentioned there. Um, and then the second is I think you've you've got to you've got to have companies that are good at communicating clearly about what they're doing, about why it matters. Uh, I think having industry groups together like we do at AMPS is also important to provide a a lobbying effort uh, in in Congress. Um, And I think as these products actually get out there more, you're going to see a much broader marketing campaign. This doesn't really make sense for us to have, you know, a, a national marketing campaign because we're just in a single restaurant now. We're still in the very, very early stages of doing this, but I think uh, um, more um, proactive marketing campaigns, industry, speaking with one voice, um, all those things will help, but it's never going to stop it. Yeah. Um, And the product that you provide, um, does it come in a minced form or whole cuts? I mean, what's the holy holy grail for you guys as as a company? Well, well, today it just comes in like as a, a chicken strip. Mm-hmm. So then they throw it on the grill and they, they make it. Um, I mean, for, for us, I, I wouldn't really call it a holy grail. It's chicken is in all sorts of different types, nuggets and strips and chicken breasts. And we want to make really good chicken and beef and pork in all of its forms mm-hmm. that taste as good or better than conventional chicken that is healthier than conventional chicken and beef and pork and lamb. Um, that's what we, we want to get to, right? So someone mm-hmm. has a choice between uh, eating a <clears throat> conventional bacon or cultivated bacon. The cultivated bacon is bacon. It tastes better. It is healthier. It's more cost effective. So as a consumer, I'm really inclined to choose it. That's that's what we want to get. Mm-hmm. Now, what's the reaction been like so far from some of those lucky customers who have managed to book a table um, at that restaurant in Washington? Yeah, thankfully, thankfully, for the most part, it's just been, this tastes like chicken. I think this is really cool. Uh, when can I come back again? Yeah, and, I mean, yeah. presumably you had lots of members of the press there as well, try, trying it as well. We have, we have. Yeah. That's excellent. Now, I can't wait to taste it myself. Now, now you've um, cleared that USDA, um, FDA hurdle. How do you see the landscape or the regulatory landscape evolving for cultivated meat in the US? I mean, even you, even okay. though you have those authorizations for your chicken product, do you see any further hurdles um, for a state level, for instance, particularly in those states where livestock agriculture uh, is so ingrained um, and important for the economy? Mm. Well, any any time we have a new, so let's say when we, when we want to launch beef, we'll necessarily need to apply to the FDA and the USDA. Mm-hmm. for beef product or same deal for pork. So there's a, a process of doing that. Um, I don't think anything in, in particular other than other than we'll have to submit an application again. I think at some point uh, the FDA will probably um, uh, think about um, providing more specific guidelines on what is required. So so as long as companies meet A through F, there's an accelerated approval process. Uh, but right now, it's a bit of a sort of a one-off review of these applications. But at some point, I, I'm sure they'll make that more efficient. Uh, mm-hmm. In the meantime, they've been thoughtful to deal with. So is the USDA. They've been very thoughtful to deal with. Um, and it seems to, seems to be working. Does it make it easier now that you've pushed that one product through um, for your subsequent, subsequent submissions? There's nothing nothing on the books that says it'll be easier, but you just imagine if human beings have reviewed one application and now are looking at another application, there's some familiarity there mm-hmm. that it'll probably be, you know, probably be a little bit more efficient than it was. And it's, it's great that your uh, dog has joined us as well. That's fantastic. <laughs> um, yeah. Now, we know from that process that there are no safety concerns with cell-cultivated meat. I was wondering in what ways it could actually be safer and more nutritious than conventional <clears throat> chicken. Well, it's definitely safer now. So it, it from a salmonella, fecal contamination, E. coli point of view, it's orders of magnitude better. Um, and that's reflected in the microbiological analysis that we, that we do and, and any company does. 
uh, from a macro nutrition perspective, so think protein, fat, carbs, it's pretty similar. I wouldn't call it better. Um, we eventually want it to be better. We want it to have less saturated fat. Uh, we want it to have uh, less cholesterol. But I think that'll come as we continue to improve it. Mm -hmm. So you've got uh, Singapore, now the USA. Where's next for good meat in terms of getting your products cleared for market? Well, we just had a, a historic announcement the other day where a, a group of some of the most credible Islamic scholars ruled that cultivated meat can be halal. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was a really important moment, I think, for the industry because it opens up cultivated meat to close to 2 billion people now. Mm -hmm. um, we'll only eat meat products if they are halal. Uh, so we think the Middle East and North African region is really compelling because of food security now because of, uh, because of this opinion. Um, but more than where we apply next, we've got to build a large scale facility because so we could have approval in 194 countries and still have the ability to only produce tens of thousands of pounds a year. And who cares? Right. And so building in larger scale facilities is really the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of um, consumer education and awareness, are we doing a good enough job at the moment as, as an industry at conveying what this product is all about? Because it's so important to the adoption of cultivated meat that we get that message right and, and also market the products right. I'm sure we're not, but I, I think the, you know, a big reason for that is the industry is just in its inf infancy, right? Mm -hmm. So we're not going to spend millions of dollars marketing it because we're only selling, you know, a very, very small amount in a single restaurant in a single, you know, place in Washington, DC. So spending real marketing dollars behind consumer education just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I'd rather spend that money on research and development right now. Mm. Um, but the industry will have to figure that out and we'll have yeah. to spend, um, and be very creative and, and thoughtful um, and how it's educating consumers um, in the way that we do it today, again, not at a national level, but the way that we do it today with our consumers is just be very direct about what the process is. Don't try to, you know, skirt around the issue. It's kind of a weird sounding process. It's okay to say that to consumers, compare mm -hmm. it to the conventional thing, show them images of it or videos of it, have them eat the chicken. Mm -hmm. What do you uh, think is the biggest threat, Josh, to the sector succeeding? Um, it's probably the difficulty in scaling up. Yeah, I don't, I don't see the biggest threat as the conventional meat industry or consumer adoption. It is very challenging and very capital intensive to build these large scale facilities. Mm -hmm. um, that's the biggest threat. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, that's something that, that we, are, we and other companies need to figure out uh, or cultivated meat won't be what we want it to be. I, I interviewed someone recently and he, uh, paraphrasing, he basically said, if we switched 100% of bio reactor capacity to the production of um, cultivated meat from pharma, um, there still wouldn't be enough to feed the Americans for half a day. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but um, mm. it's an enormous challenge. Yeah, I don't know what the existing bio reactor capacity is, but um, there's nothing... A bioreactor is just a vessel made of steel with um, some complex components. Humans can build them. And if you build large enough vessels and enough of them, you can make tens of millions of pounds of meat. So there's nothing sort of in the law of physics that stops it. Mm -hmm. um, it's just really expensive. Um so companies like ours either need to figure out a way to ensure they access the capital to do it, mm -hmm. or they need to figure out a more creative way to do it. Yeah. Or both. Yeah. And it might not necessarily be from the VC community. Uh, community. It could be government subsidies. Could be. Yeah. Could be. Um, we're going to just go to some wrap-up questions now, Josh. Um, I'm aware of the time. Are there any new products or innovations in the pipeline for good meat that you can share with our readers? Uh, working, on, working on beef. I'm hoping to submit that application to the FDA before the end of the year. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably the most significant thing. Yeah. And uh, what's the end game for a company such as uh, Good Meat? Um, meat that doesn't require the slaughter of animal is the primary meat that our planet consumes. That's, mm -hmm. the, that's the end game. Yeah. 
And finally, let's fast forward to 2050. Um, what sort of an industry do you predict we will have by then? And what impact do you think, or you, do you hope, good meat mm. um, will have made to that sector? I think by 2050, it will be broadly acknowledged that cultivated meat is either currently the world's most consumed meat or will obviously be the world's most consumed meat. Think of electric cars today, even though less than 2% of the cars on the road today are electric, broadly people understand mm -hmm. that the world's moving away from gasoline power cars to electric. Even if you really love your gasoline powered truck, you acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think um, in 2050, we'll either be in that place, but I hope more optimistically at a place where it already is um, the most consumed meat. Um, and that'll, that'll be a better world. Yeah. Well, look, Josh, thank you very much for joining us. This, uh, yeah. it's a career highlight for me. I've been following this sector since 2013. Awesome. Um, tried to, tried to convince a previous boss to launch a magazine about it and he mm. told me I was mad. So here we are today. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Love. thank you very much for your time. And, uh, yeah, you must tell me your dog trainer cause <laughs> uh, my dog certainly would not have sat behind me like that. <laughs> <laughs> my girl, she loves it. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for caring about this. Thank <laughs> you.